today we're going to be talking about not thinking of the monkey. So that's going to require a little bit of introduction. There's a, a superstition that I became acquainted with when I lived in a monastic community that if you think about a monkey while you take medicine, the medicine doesn't work. And that's from some culture somewhere around the world. I couldn't tell you, really. Um, probably in multiple cultures. Yeah, there's probably something very similar across a lot of cultures. But it's an interesting little idea because the moment you believe that, then, while taking medicine, you can't help but think of the monkey. And that creates this neat little microcosm for us to play with the idea of willpower mm -hmm. and the ability to make a decision about the experience that we're going to have and then carry that decision through because that's a really, really tricky sort of process. It's very difficult to actually exert control over the unfolding of your experience in that way. Yeah, it's super hard. I, I took a lot of bus routes and a lot of uh, BART routes traversing the city in my, in my, my work career. Uh, work career. <laughs> a little redundant. But in any case, um, I would always try and set some little parameters for myself on what those trips were going to look like that day. Like, today I'm only going to watch TED Talks, or today I'm going to think about my finances, or today I'm going to, you know, whatever the goal happened to be. And, and <clears throat> I'd get on the bus, and sure enough, three or four stops in, I've thought about like 60,000 different things mm -hmm. than the thing that I intended to focus on that day. Yeah, and if you want to make sort of a large scale change in the way that you experience life if maybe what you're experiencing right now isn't the most sort of fortunate sort of experience that you're going to have to really consistently make decisions and follow through with those decisions about what your experience is going to be and that sort of consistency requires you to develop certain skills uh, and it requires you to develop a lot of willpower so Today, we're just going to be talking about sort of opportunities to create little spaces in your life where you can practice those skills so that you get better and better and better at them. They become easier and easier. And sort of the sort of thing that happens for you unconsciously, you just make a decision and you stick to it and you don't have that same experience of temptation. So, so I would ask you, like, a, you know, in terms of like meditation, you, you've probably noticed like your willpower, uh, grow pretty exponentially right and able to like restrain yourself from like having meandering thoughts and things like that um there's a lot of there's a lot of misconceptions about that actually with practices like meditation or any kind of introspective practice the main thing is that uh the mind does its does its stuff what you learn to do is to catch it doing its stuff sooner so there goes distraction happening and to bring it back in my experience, at least, you don't actually reach a place where you never get distracted. Sure. You you reach a place where the proportion of your time that you spend with some distraction gets much, 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 much smaller. And you're able to come back more rapidly and stay where you want to be for longer. So this would be creating those spaces where we could practice that, right? Exactly. And creating the right so sorts of attitudes of mind around that. Okay. This is, some, this is something that needs to be really playful. There's this idea that if I, if I set out to do something and then I fail to do that thing, that there should be a very frustrating experience. Uh, and frustration is not helpful at all in this domain because as you practice this, what you discover more and more and more is, oh, I'm distracted a lot and I don't <laughs> notice it usually. Yeah. So as you practice, the overwhelming experience is you are distracted more often than you were before. You were just, you were more distracted before, but you didn't notice it. So it right. wasn't a part of your experience. But now that you're paying attention for it, it's like, oh, I'm failing at this focusing thing quite a lot. So you have to have this really sort of celebratory attitude of mind with it that, ah, oh, I'm distracted. Awesome. Right. There was a time in my life when I would have never noticed this. I would have just gone off on whatever train of thought is passing along here and going on with this whole adventure and forgotten what it was I wanted my life experience to be. And probably that adventure would have taken me down a dark path. So this is good. I got off the train. I'm back here. What was I doing again? <laughs> and really having the attitude of this is something to celebrate. So I used to, I used to have a little party every time I noticed that I would get distracted when I was living at the monastery. And it came out of this whole discussion we were having about people's frustrations around this point. The teacher who was leading the session that day 
said, you know, what would it be like to just say thanks every time you come back? And I've been reading about some other practices from some religion or another, and I, I settled on seven thanks would be like, that would be a, a good number. Seven's like a cool, cool rad number. Mm. Uh, don't spend enough time with that. Partial even numbers. I'm a, I'm a, a big of I'm, a, I'm a big eight man. Right, so exactly. It's exactly. a real, real wonderful number. Four and eight have always been some of my favorites. So seven, boom, let's do this. What's it going to look like? And immediately, the story is, oh my god, I would if I tried to spend a whole, you know, half hour, hour long meditation session just saying thanks seven times every time I got distracted. Yeah, I don't think I would get through two thanks before noticing that I was distracted again from that. Right. Which means now, you know, I'm in the hole. <laughs> I've got five things to go and I got seven more behind it. Oh, I'm going to do nothing but sit there saying thanks to myself in my head all session. And yeah, I actually, course, I remember when you came home from the monastery and we're still practicing that. Yeah. Uh, and of course, that's, that's, it's going to be terrible, right? Yeah, you drove me up a wall with it, but it was, I understood, you know. <laughs> but, of course, the experience is nothing like the story that pops up in the head about it and actually spending an hour just being thankful is a really pleasant rewarding sort of thing uh so that worked out really well but you know maybe that's maybe you're busy maybe you're on the go maybe you don't have quite the time for that mm -hmm. you can still find small little slices in your life where this is a possibility so the other day at the bus stop waiting for the bus pull out my wonderful technology oh the bus is coming in six minutes and then i noticed i'm still looking down the street to see if the bus has come. And then I go, do, but do is whatever. But is that just a history of the bus app has lied to me? Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. Right? There, there are any number of reasons why that behavior exists. And we don't even have to worry about why that behavior exists, right? Because once that inclination is noticed, that can be the foil that we work against. Right. So here I am. Okay. One, two, three, four, five times I've noticed that I fruitlessly looked down the street to see if the bus has come. I'm not going to look to the left anymore. <laughs> Until the bus shows up, I'm looking straight ahead. My neck can go to the right, to straight ahead, and that's it. Like, if, you know, if I get uncomfortable, sure, I can move to the right. But I'm not moving to the left, right? Now I've set the intention. Mm -hmm. Now I get to watch as the forces within my mind that were driving that behavior start pushing up against this intention and trying to wear it down. And I get to see how it is that I get led away from that intention and then how I get led towards the behavior that I'm trying not to realize. Yeah. I right. I had that issue with mathematics. I could be like, mm. you know, I'd sit down and be like, okay, I'm going to do 15 minutes of math and I'm not going to think about other things. I'm just going to do math for 15 minutes. And it was nigh impossible to do math for 15 minutes for a long time. Eventually yeah. got to a place where I studied statistics and the problems took longer than 15 minutes. So I didn't have a choice. <laughs> yeah. But sometimes that urgency can overcome that sort of drive to those sorts of behaviors. But that's why I wrote essays at night. <laughs> right. When I was in college, I, I, would, I was a serious procrastinator and I would just wait until... The day before the essay was due, I would do a little bits of research or I'd think about it here and there, but all the writing happened the night before because the panic about not finishing on time actually was enough to override the will to distraction. Right, right. And it's, that is so draining, so nerve-wracking, so damaging Yeah. that that was one of the things that made me really realize I have to get my mind in order. Right. I can't. I can't live like this. I can't spend my whole life swinging from the extremes of procrastination to the extremes of productivity, driven only by anxiety about the fear that somebody's going to get mad at me. That can't be the life that I live. Totally. All right. So that that's what sent me off in this direction. Like, okay, I got to figure it out. Somebody out there's got to know right. something about how this works. And you know. So let me ask you this. We're creating that space in our bus stop example mm -hmm. for us to practice like some restraint. We can only look forward. We can always look to the right. And and packing that up and putting it in our toolbox, like how do we use that going forward? Like what am I, what am I trying to shape with? Like what behavior is that going to lead me to? Well, <clears throat> it's actually, it's not necessarily leading you to a behavior. It's leading you to developing a skill. Right. Because setting an intention and remaining focused on it 
gets easier over time. Right. And you're, you're essentially creating a stress, right? Your brain works on the same principle as your body. It, it adapts to stressors. Right? If you want to get stronger, you got to lift heavy weights and that stresses your muscles and the process of them repairing themselves then causes the adaptation. You got new muscle tissue, your brain, you create a stress and it responds to that by building the neural pathways that are going to make overcoming that stress easier. That's like wonderful. to whatever that challenge is. So we're, so, yeah, we're building our neural pathways in order to be able to respond to that better. And think about like the, the productivity yield that you get out of that over time. If you can master it, is absolutely. Like, you can stay entrenched on something. Come on. When it's, when it's time to get down to business, you get down to business. Yeah. That's, that's a, a good life skill yeah. to have in your, in your toolkit. And, you know, I see it in all sorts of little places. It gets reflected back to me. The other day I was working with a client on um, a project in a programming language that I'm not that familiar with and not that partial to. C++ for those who know their programming languages. That's the reason I didn't become a professional programmer is people told me that to do that, you had to work in C++. And I went, okay, I'm going to be a music major then. <laughs> I hate this. You know, so that's that's my relationship to, to C++. It's very old. So here I am, I'm doing C++, and I'm in some weird little minutiae, some corner of it, and things aren't working. And I'm sitting there, I'm cruising, 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 overcoming little things. And eventually it just starts to be sort of, I'm getting to the point where I'm listening to a voice in my head that's telling me really old stories about how unpleasant this is, mm -hmm. right? Because this is, you know, that experience, I was 17. Yeah. The first time I learned C++. Um, and 17-year-old me had a very different relationship to his experience than I do now, but those neural pathways are still chilling there and now they're getting activated. And I just had to have the self-knowledge to go, hey, I got to take a 15-minute break, right? I'll be back. And I just went got some water, brushed my teeth, did like some little caretaking things that I do that are like the signal, like, hey, we're taking care of ourselves right now. And I just sat down and I meditated for 10 minutes, got my mind in order, said, okay, these, these are the things that I have noticed. No attention goes to them anymore. Right? I'm going to go back in there. And I don't care what they say, not paying any attention. Yeah. And then you know, that was four hours in and we did another two hours. Um, Damn, that's some heavy lifting. And at the, at the end of it, you know, this guy's saying, how, how do you focus on something for that long? I mean, and I know you don't like this. How, how do you do that? It's like, well, I mean, you know, it's, it's just a skill. Yeah. It's just, and that was kind of my rep at the monastery. I was the computer fixing kind of guy. Cause you know, they ran nonprofits and aid work and whatnot out of there. So you know, a bunch of monks with computers and it's not really their, their specialty. And they're like, oh, you know how to fix these things? And I was sitting one day trying to get, you know, we have very intermittent internet connection up there. And so the main concern that people had was that they wanted to be able to just process email, even if the internet went down. Right. So I was trying to figure out how to get Firefox and Google apps, email accounts to cooperate, to actually do an offline mode. And it was just during this weird window where that was not really a thing. So I was like installing a beta branch and doing all this stuff for this guy. And I was there for like six, seven hours tinkering with this thing. And I got it working for him. And he was just kind of like, how is that even a thing? You know? Yeah. And that's the intersection of, well, actually you guys have been training me to do this. And this is an domain that I've actually spent a lot of time in my life. And so my first job was, you know, as a network technician, right. You know, it, intersection of those two things. So that's my testimony as to how this actually plays out. It does produce real results. People will reflect it back to you that, wow, you can actually focus for a long time when you want to. So yeah, that's, you know, in the same way that when somebody learns how to drive, it's stressful and it's difficult and oh my god, what did I, I got to check this and I got to look at this and then three months later, it's you're completely unconscious and you just hop into a vehicle and then you get out of the vehicle. It's parked. <laughs> how did I get here? Right? Spent yep. the whole time thinking about what's going to happen at work or fiddling with the radio and whatnot. Right? The brain is capable of building new capacities if it is sufficiently stressed often enough. So we're going to create that stress. So that's that's a bit of the picture. So again, like just summarizing it a little bit, what we're doing is we're attempting to create small spaces where we can give our mind just a few tiny constraints 
It can even be mm -hmm. something kind of playful. And what that does is it kind of just exercises us in a way that allows us to, like, you know, develop the ability to focus in a little bit and act with some restraint when we're trying to learn or focus on new things. Yeah. You know, in a formal introspective practice setting, right, that's actually the purpose of either focusing on your breath or focusing on a particular image or chanting or uh, reciting a memorized piece of text, all of those things actually serve the same purpose right. to give you a thing that you're supposed to be doing that creates a window into how the forces within your mind undermine that, right? undermine your choice. So we're looking at filling up all the little spaces in our life with more opportunities for that, right? Taking that out of a formal introspective practice, moving it into, you know, I've got, I've got three minutes at the bus stop. Yeah. Can I get a couple reps in? Right. It's perfect. Really, it's something that you should think about sort of like exercise. You know, it's just mental exercise. It's just, okay. You know, there are all sorts of ways that then you can actually do that in a formal practice setting too. My favorite is I always just set my timer when I'm going to sit down from a meditation and I just set it slightly out of, slightly into my peripheral. Right. So, I, so that I can see that it's there, but if I don't turn my head, I can't see information about it. And then I get to watch as I get more and more agitated, wanting to look at it. How long do I, okay. I set, you know, I set a timer for half an hour. How long do I have left? Right. And like my legs going to sleep and I'm like, am I going to make it or <laughs> do I need to adjust my leg? Am I going to be able to walk after this? Right. Like how long do I have left? And it's actually really funny when I was at the monastery, you know, they, somebody had a bell, they had a timer. The rest of us didn't have a timer. We we're just sitting around. Right. Um, but you would sit there, the bell would ring a little chime or whatever. And you would sit and then half an hour later, there goes the bell again, right? And I got to the point where just from knowledge of the processes that unfold in my mind around the timing, I could start a 10 second countdown. Right. And the bell would ring within that 10 seconds. So I'm sitting there for half an hour and then I feel certain things in my mind. I feel a certain agitation and go, oh, that's the bell agitation. Okay, 10, 9, 8. Seven and somewhere in that countdown, boom! Just because there are things going on in my body that actually work as a decent time timetable that I'm not actually aware of, but there are processes in my mind that are aware of them enough totally to start up certain sorts of agitation. So, just from having a sense of that, reading the weather as it were in my mind. Or the, of reading the mental tea leaves I'm like, oh yeah it must be getting close to the time now so one a couple of opportunities around that if you want to get a little playful if you got an introspective practice set up if you got yourself a little space take a picture of a monkey to the wall just above where you usually look yeah and then just don't look at the monkey <laughs> it can it can be a very literal thing <laughs> it's perfect right because then you know maybe what is it? On The Simpsons, they have that angry monkey that's always, like, shaking a banana. Is oh, that... yeah, yeah, yeah. That's totally... No, it's not The Simpsons. It's uh, Family Guy. It's a few... Fa... Oh, yes, Family Guy. There we go. Yeah, the monkey that lives in the closet and just points and... Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> you know, put, that, put that guy up there. Right? If you see that guy, you know. Hey, whoa. <laughs> I, just, I just lost the game. Yeah, this is... Well, there you go. Did, you... Did I tell you that I told the monks about the game? No, no. Yeah. Yeah, we got into a discussion of memes at one point, and uh, I was like, oh, well, there's this, you know, if you want to talk about sort of subversion of of your desired cognitive experiences, right? Like, here's this idea of the game, right? As soon as you know about the game, you're playing the game. As soon as you think about the game, you've lost the game. Yep. Once you buy into that, then there's this entire process of cognition that unfolds involuntarily. You think of the game, I just lost the game. <laughs> You didn't will yourself to lose the game, but it happened. Yep. And it's really important to understand because as we go through our lives, we can have this illusion of control, right? That I'm just a person who's here making all these decisions and I just get to do exactly what I want. And for most of us, most of the time, that's not really what's going on. The mind is a very, very complex system. 
Right. And the determinants of what actually gets presented to you as your experience uh, are manifold. There are many, many things that go into building up your experience. And most of them are happening behind the scenes for most of us. And so this is, again, creating opportunities to peer sort of behind the curtain to find out what's going on, what's going into building up our experience. And this is one of the skills that makes that possible. Perfect. All right.